Hello beautiful people, I am Daisy, welcome to my channel, and in this video we're moving through the book titled The Man Who Knew by Ralph Waldo Trine. I do have other books by this author, so please do make sure to check my playlist. We are now going to move on to chapter 13. I do hope that you're enjoying this book. I look forward to your comments. All right, I am not going to sit here and expand on this because there's a lot of scripture and in the use of scripture the author is using this as hey these were statements made by the people that were there during the time of Jesus and these scriptures serve as testament to the character and the nature of the man and the message that he was bringing to the world a message that still holds true today that there is a spiritual life in man and that the kingdom of heaven is within all right, I'm going to go right to this chapter 13 titled, Entry to Jerusalem to Die. There was never any laziness in the young rabbi prophet of Galilee. Prodigious was his zeal to carry his gospel, his good news, to the needy people everywhere. And in a supreme manner, he sensed the people's needs. From village to village, wherever he could be of greatest help, he went. The accounts indicate that the crowds seeking his help were sometimes very great. Quote, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were distressed and scattered as sheep not having a shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. End quote. Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 through 37. His work must have often have been very exhausting. Self-giving contact with people, especially in crowds, take a great deal out of a sensitively organized person. A man of the open, Jesus sought quiet and rest and recuperation in the open. And outdoors, he experienced those refreshing periods of prayer and communion by which he kept intact his sense of union with the Father. Time after time, the accounts relate these occurrences. Quote, in the morning, a great while before day, he rose up and went out and departed into a desert place and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him and they found him and say unto him, all are seeking thee. And he said unto them, let us go elsewhere into the next towns that I may preach there also. For to this end came I forth. End quote. The book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 35 through 38. When he had finished in one village, down the road he went to another, sometimes alone, sometimes with one or two, sometimes with more of his disciples. Eager he was always to fulfill his promise. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth of the life the kingdom of God within, the truth not only to be accepted and believed, but also to be lived. Quote, By their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. End quote. Book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 20 through 21. Not only was he ever ready to share his truth with the people, but he was ever eager to free them and save them from the enervating and deadly dogma which was ceaselessly put about by the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. The world has perhaps never seen a greater enemy of dogma than this herald of truth. He knew that truth, his truth, and dogma could never exist together, and he never hesitated to denounce its upholders and purveyors. He knew how self-seeking and deadly they were both as individuals and as representatives of institutions. He knew how they lived as parasites among the people. Quote, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. End quote. Book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 20. Inevitably, he aroused the enmity of those he so frequently denounced, at times to their very faces. He was interfering with their authority, their business, their living. More than once, they had sent spies, even from Jerusalem, to watch him, 
to catch him in a snare. They never succeeded, however, in doing this. So good a reader was he of human nature and human motives, so clear in his inseeing, that instead he almost always confounded them. He had a growing sense of their determination, as we say, to get him. It did not appear to bother him, and gradually he seemed to arrive at a point where he actually, without fear, courted an open conflict with them. Quote, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. End quote. Book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 21. This was no idle statement on his part as it turned out. His face was set toward Jerusalem, and his disciples were to go with him. The coming conflict might certainly mean his death, and he planned it for a time when it might most reasonably occur. The great annual festival ceremony of the Jews, the Passover, was soon to be celebrated. He knew it was at Jerusalem that he would be killed and that there would be no better time or occasion. He alone knew that he was actually courting death. His friends and followers in various localities warned him that the temple authorities were seeking him and advised him not to go that year. Already the chief priests and the Pharisees, hearing how boldly he had denounced them, how he was teaching the people not in their established religious code, and at times quite contrary to it, and how great was the number of people now following him, had called the council at which Caiaphas, the chief priest, spoke. If we let him alone, he said, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away our place and nation. Then from that day forth they took counsel together to put him to death, and they watched him and sent forth spies, which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. This became quite generally known. There was also considerable talk and speculation throughout the countryside in many directions, just as there was at Jerusalem. Of one group which had already gone up in preparation for the feast, the account reads, then saw they for Jesus, and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What you think? That he will not come to the feast? Six days then before the Passover, we find Jesus and his disciples at Bethany, the home of his friends Mary and Martha, and their brother Lazarus. Bethany is just outside Jerusalem, whither they are bound, but a short walk away. Jesus knows, then, that at any time he is likely to be captured, to be tried, and to be put to death. He evidently has his own thoughts and plans about it, too. In fact, he will see to it that he is arrested. He will do such things that the authorities cannot ignore him, even if they would. They would probably find an easy ally to sanction their decree in the ruling Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, who not only detested Jews, but took pleasure in acts of violence and sometimes in executions without form of trial. It was Pilate who made his legions enter Jerusalem with figures of the God Emperor emblazoned on their standards, notwithstanding his knowledge of how the Jews abhorred idolatry and graven images of any type. But Tiberius Caesar, the god-emperor, born of a virgin, must have homage above every living man. It is interesting to note that the fiction of Tiberius being born of a virgin was known to Jesus and his followers and to the people of Jerusalem and Judea, but that Jesus and his followers and all the people knew nothing of the fiction that he, Jesus, was born of a virgin. This was due to the fact that the fiction connected with Jesus did not take form until a system of belief concerning him began to take definite form a number of years later. It is the spring of the year in Judea, the month of Adar, and the festival of spirit is in the air everywhere. All Jewry is on its way to the holy city, in pilgrimage to celebrate the feast which takes their minds back to their people's escape from Egypt so many years ago. 
From every hamlet and village and city, devoted bands are on their way. The great bulk are on foot, the rich in litters, the bankers and merchants on camels. From the uttermost parts of then known earth they come. From nearby comes Herod and Pontius Pilate from his official seat at Caesarea by the sea, and minor and new Roman officials eager to see this strange festival. There are caravans fetching all kinds of goods for market with the hosts that will be in Jerusalem. Great loads of palm branches are brought from the growths along the Jordan for decorations and the buildings of booths. The lanes and at places the highways are almost choked with lambs to be sold for the paschal rite, heifers for sacrifice, and vendors of doves with their great towering crates. Music is in the air. A million and a half of pilgrims will eventually be in Jerusalem. On the road leading down into the city from Olivet, Jesus comes with his disciples, heading a considerable band of his Galilean followers, among whom are a number of devoted women. An interesting, if not a strange thing, now happens. Jesus sends back to the little village which they have just passed and where they have seen a colt standing, tied for hire, as was common at this festival time, with instructions that it be brought to them. One account says an ass, one a donkey, one a colt. Anyway, there is a sufficient agreement to show that it was a four-footed creature and one that might be ridden. Why did he do this? Did something come to his mind there that he had read in the scroll of the law and prophets, the scripture of the time, and did he half venture himself as a fulfillment of prophecy? Or did he think it might please his followers? Or did he see that it would help him to achieve his end, his set purpose of causing an annoyance occurrence of which the authorities would hear, which they would perhaps witness, and of which, in any event, they would have to take cognizance? We do not know. It would not seem in the genius of the master to do it for show. At any rate, some of his followers threw clothes on the colt and sat him on it. The little procession then moved forward, some of the disciples and others of the more enthusiastic casting their garments before him and bursting into song. As they were crossing the valley of Hedron on their way to the city gates, they were met by another little band of Galilean followers who had already come to Jerusalem. These came out waving palm branches and singing. Some of the men and women who had accompanied him from Bethany sang as they came. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. From the band that had come out to meet them from the city gates came the response, For his mercy endureth forever. And again from the incoming pilgrim band, Ozana, Ozana, the son of David, the mighty one, the mighty one, son of David. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And this, with various types of song and response, was a common way of greeting pilgrim bands as they came up the great festival. The procession of which Jesus was the center began to be considerably augmented. Ardent friends, townspeople, curiosity seekers, boys with their shrill voices who so quickly gather on such occasions. Some of his disciples and friends began to take alarm. They were pleased at the reception, but they saw he was not entering the city as a conqueror. Those high in authority were not there to receive him. No, not one. As his following grew, it became mostly a shouting rabble. Master, see what you are doing. Be careful, be careful for your safety and for ours. They feared that it might take on the appearance of a nationalist demonstration, for the Roman authorities had their legionaries everywhere, and they might with ruthless force quickly check it, as they had many others. They knew also that the chief priests and the Pharisees and their council had their spies posted, and that they might move with quick vengeance against such a demonstration flouting their authority, especially when they knew who the leader was. There was danger from both sides. The enthusiastic admirers 
and the staunch supporters of the master fancied that he was actually to ascend the throne of David, he, son of David, and to become their king. Others, in suppressed excitement, thought only that something most unusual, they knew not exactly what, was about to occur. This we infer from Luke's account, quote, they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear, end quote. But in the eyes of the more respectable and aristocratic Jews, Jesus and his band of disciples and elated followers were nothing more than an ill-clad group of ignorant countrymen and hangers-on, no different from thousands of others drawn on this occasion to the holy city. They had seen many such groups in other years. Now, however, it began to be noised about that the prophet of Galilee and his following were come. Nothing immediately happened. The genius of the master again asserted itself. He dismounted from the colt, and the procession disbanded, threading itself in little groups here and there as they entered the city gate and made their way to the temple. Whatever was in the mind of the prophet of Galilee, whatever his purpose, he felt that it had been fulfilled. Everything was carefully planned on his part during these final six days at Jerusalem, and in all things he seems to have acted with a very definite precision. We of today, partly because of the majestic music which has since been written and which is sung in the churches, get the impression that there was a great triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Evidently there was not. The occasion, however, served some purpose in the mind and the plan of the Master. Might he have fulfilled, for those who then, and even more today, set store by such things, the strained letter of some prophecy, Zechariah, for example, quote, The king shall come to thee slowly and riding upon an ass, end quote. Yet we can rest assured that the genius of the Master in his great message of life was far greater than this. It was approaching evening when he and his disciples reached the temple, about the time of the evening sacrifice, and with all other activities ceased. The city was thronged with people. There was no place to stay, so Jesus and his little band made their way across to nearby Bethany, perhaps to the home of their friends with whom they had so often tarried. End of chapter 13 Stay in your comfy chair. We're going to continue and roll on to the next chapter. Before I do flip this page, be so kind, hit that like button. All right, chapter 14. He teaches the great truth. The next morning, as he and his 12 stalwart followers come to the temple court, activity is at its highest. The bleeding of frightened animals soon to be killed for sacrifice, with the barnyard smells filling the air, the vendors of doves hurrying here and there, traders on the concessions crying their wares, priests in their abundant and richly colored robes hurrying about, money changers doing a thriving business, translating species from many different provinces and countries into the temple coin. The master and his followers in their provincial garb pushed or jostled or importuned to buy, Possibly someone is cheated by a money changer, or perhaps some poor woman with her scanty savings is overcharged for a pair of doves. Whatever the immediate occasion, the prophet of Galilee is stirred and stirred deeply. Then, in a fury, he overthrows the tables of the money changers and turns upon the different traffickers to drive them out of the temple court. Quote, it is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. End quote. At any previous time, however deeply he might have been aroused, his method would have been that of gentle admonition. Such was the nature of the man. But now a change has come. A fire and a determination seem to burn in every act. Is it part of a plan on his part to compel those who are seeking his arrest to make it? The news of his daring quickly spreads. He must inevitably hear from the temple authorities. That day and the next, he and his followers make their way through various parts of the temple, 
attracting, even among the great throngs, more and more attention. He boldly teaches in the temple. He denounces with increasing violence the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests. He discusses whatever they will with excited priests sent to trap him. They try to make an ally of the Roman authorities that they may trap him in a civil or political indiscretion or offense. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders even follow him at times as he walks through the temple. They are getting continually more anxious. And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. From the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 13 through 17. In various ways, they again try repeatedly to trap him, but again, in practically all cases, they are trapped themselves. Sometimes it results in jeers from the crowd standing by and listening. They're getting continually more angry and desperate and determined. Here also occurs an incident which brings a masterful teaching, universal and timeless in its content. The incident of the woman taken in adultery. An expositor takes seven pages to elucidate it. A motion picture producer might require seven reels. The real gist is this. He among you that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. A closely allied law pertaining to our common life would be, he alone that is perfect has the right to judge another and no one is perfect. Were he perfect, he still would not judge another. Anyway, to judge another, it would be necessary to have all the facts running back even to generations, and these no one ever has. The master understood. He knew. Go thy way, and henceforth sin no more. Interesting things occurred one after another. His every move and act and saying seemed to be charged more than ever with, I must be about my father's business. Everything points to the fact that he realized his end was near. Some of his most salient teachings seem directed to clarify further and emphasize his great fundamental message, which during the previous months and years he had worked so hard to deliver. Added statements, brilliant parables, pointed back to the kingdom and centered around it, but they more and more involved something to be done, rather than something merely to be received and believed. Men believing acted, and in acting, they were saved. Merely to believe is nothing. It gets one nowhere unless it is followed by doing. It is thus that the truth makes one free. His observation is keen. He sees everything and he pours out many a lesson. Quote, and Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much, and there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which had cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living.
End quote. From the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 41 through 44. Another occasion, arising from the priestly group, gave him an opportunity for his great saying. Just what they had in mind on this occasion, it is very hard to tell. A lawyer, an interpreter of the ecclesiastical code, stood up and asked the question. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. It seems almost as if providence destined that this great affirmation should come during the last week of his life and ministry here. It was the most important thing of these last few days, even more important than his death. For it was primarily, we might say, to seal this fundamental thought into the thought and the life of the world that he willingly and eagerly gave his life for our own good and our share in the good of the world, we must return to it. Time is passing, many things are happening, and the priestly authorities are getting desperate. They clearly see now that it is either his life or their authority and power and living. They would either make a holiday of him or he would make a laughing stock of them. The whole ecclesiastical system, with all its prerequisites that it has taken years and even generations to build up, with all its ramifications of tribute that flow in from many different sources, is being endangered. The chief priests then ordered that he be taken and brought to them. They must have a sufficient charge, with sufficient evidence, however, and they dare not have him taken in public, lest his friends and followers and the friendly populace cry out against it and make a commotion which the Roman officials might be called upon to deal with. They then resort to money and bargain with Judas, whom they find with an eye to business. They make a compact that he will lead them and their officers to some secret place under cover of darkness where Jesus may be taken in and in this way avoid the risk of any protest or tumult. Of the twelve, Judas seems the most worldly minded, the most actuated by a sense of personal gain, and the most discontented with the outcome of three years association with the master. The wait is not long. End of chapter 14. Let's head over to the next video where I will continue and see what happens when a brave man chooses death.